Hello and welcome to Talk Ag to Me, the podcast dedicated to improving ag literacy around the globe. I'm your host, Brennan Black, and today I'm joined by our sarcastic co-host, Abby Prince. Hello, guys. It's been a long time, but I'm back. I didn't die. I'm still alive. She is here. Barely. Unfortunately, Evan could not join us today, but in his place, we have the one and only Haley Fernandez. Hello, everyone. I'm here joining the podcast today. <laughs> so, similar to how we had Macy in the last episode, um, we're bringing in more um, just friends of ours, FFA members, people who are more involved in these kinds of issues and more Alumni? interested in them. Oh, my. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> Macy, go Macy was an FFA member, so um, that's why I said that. Anyway. Everybody else is. So. Yeah. So we're bringing in more people um, kind of similar to our age so we can have these kinds of discussions about various issues because, for one, it's hard to get people who are working every day to, you know, take a few minutes to talk to us about stuff if they're, like, 40. But also because we like to have people <laughs> anyway what? we like to have people that are actually heavily involved in these issues in terms of the amount of research mm-hmm. they do and i think that Haley as well as abby fit the bill in this one because both of these young ladies did prepared speeches prepared ffa speeches on the issue that we'll be discussing in, in today's episode and so before i begin uh, i'd like to kind of address a lot of our uh, late episode um information at the beginning now, because we know a lot of you guys don't like to listen all the way to the end, because you guys are heathens. Wow, we just them out. <laughs> That's what you gotta do to get their attention. Anyway, okay, okay. before we start, I'd like to thank all you guys for watching our last episode. I know it was kind of long, it was a two-parter, but it was a big episode, so we needed to address as much information as possible, and because it's such a big topic, and rights is huge, we're gonna be addressing it in future episodes as well, but I'd like to thank all you guys for checking that episode out. I'd like to, um, you know, just kind of give a, a big thanks to all of our supporters that are constantly sharing our episodes and posting about us and I've had people you know talking on the side of the street talking about our podcast so it's pretty cool to have a lot of support out there um so I'd like to thank you guys for that I also like to encourage you to subscribe to our channel and to encourage your friends and family to subscribe to our channel because while we may have a lot of support we don't have a lot of subscribers and subscribers are 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 kind of what we're shooting here for not to get famous or anything but I mean if we get a good amount of them we can get um ad revenue and that kind of thing will compensated right so if we get ad revenue we can get better equipment which will give you guys better listening quality and I the list goes on yeah yeah there's there's a whole domino effect here basically we're also reaching more people we're reaching way. more people and that's the entire purpose of our of our uh, podcast here is we're trying to improve ag literacy as i mentioned in, in the intro so um <clears throat> that being said enough of the uh you know the blah blah blah. The, you know, the, Let's get into it. The, the begging. To get into our topic today, we're going to be talking about an issue that's, I guess you could say it's controversial in the ag industry. I think it's a little bit less controversial than, say, animal rights, for example, because um, it's a little bit more looked over than I believe it should be. It's something that um, I was just talking to uh, these two about, that it's something that is more of an issue than people make of it and it needs to be addressed more more often than it really is in uh, legislature, but it's becoming a lot more um, a lot more popular. So, the issue today is labeling of foods, and I'm gonna let these girls kind of take away the the conversation because, like I said, they both did prepared speech uh, prepared speeches on it. I know a little bit, but not you know not nearly as much as them. So I'm gonna let them take it away. But just to kind of give you guys a quick uh, brief summary of today's episode, we're just gonna be talking about labels that are on foods in the supermarket. Um, I mean, you have organic labels, non-GMO. Um, hormone free, antibiotic free. The you know, there's a lot of labels that these girls can give you a lot of information on, and there's you know some some issues with putting labels on foods that we're also going to be discussing today. So I'm going to kind of pass the torch on to them, and um, I guess we're going to kind of just jump into it with the first question that I could think of, which is really why put labels on food in the first place, or why do why do labels exist? So if whoever wants to take the conversation from there all right yeah okay so i think the biggest reason why uh, manufacturers put labels on food products is to um kind of convince consumers that theirs is the better product because it is free of whatever or it's organic so that means it's in quotes again better than conventional whatever they use that type of um, marketing to say if my product is free of antibiotics or hormones, um, whatever product that does have that in there or does not have the label will harm you in some way. And so if that label's on there, it just fears the consumer that their product is better. Well, I think even going uh, but further behind that, 
labels really were probably started as a way to help consumers knowing what exactly is in their food you have um, in terms of allergies um, what allergens are in the food and also um, the calorie content of a product the nutritional information consumers wanted to know this information and that's kind of probably where the basis of the most basic labels were started and from there marketers started realizing that maybe people are paying attention to these little um, stickers on the labels and realizing um, maybe we can profit off of that <laughs> my notes are flying but um, <laughs> So from there you get um, more of these labels that Abby was talking about that really influence a consumer um, consumer's purchasing habits um, towards food depending on what those labels say. Um, and so what may have started as a simple way of informing consumers is now ironically kind of um, uneducating them and leading to a more uneducated uh, society in terms of um, agriculture as a whole. It's definitely got about out, out of hand. For sure. I think it's really frustrating for me at least to go to go go to the grocery store and buy chicken or beef and it says antibiotic or hormone free and I was like, there was none of these in the first place. It's against the law for humans to consume this and so it's just really frustrating, at least for me and probably for you guys too, if you go shopping to find that on a product and it's like, Ah, this already wasn't in here so like, yeah, I guess you're speaking the truth, but kinda like what Haley said, you're misinforming consumers that other products that don't have this label actually contain that type of, um, have antibiotics or hormones in it, just with those two labels at least. So to, to give you guys a quick anecdote to um, what uh, they were just talking about, um, there's a quick little story. I went with my mom to Costco, like, was this last week? And we were going over to the produce section because I love the produce section of Costco. <laughs> Papers are still I'm sorry. flying. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, we're in Costco, and I walk over to the grape section. I'm looking at grapes because I love grapes with passion. And so I'm looking through all these boxes of grapes, and I noticed that there are seedless grapes, and then there's the grapes with seeds, and they're, they're significantly bigger than the seedless grapes. Yes. And so I was looking at these, I was kind of thinking, so are seedless grapes genetically modified then? Yeah. But well, I, well, as, I, as I was thinking, because I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about it, because there are certain, like, Seedless watermelons, those are genetically modified. You can't crossbreed a watermelon to not have seeds. Oh, okay. You can crossbreed grapes to not have seeds. I didn't oh. know that. So I was looking that up, and I noticed, before I looked this up, I noticed that there was a, a package of grapes that said it was GMO-free, but they were seedless grapes. So before looking it up, I was like, okay, well, if you can GMO uh, grapes to not have seeds in it, how can they put this sticker on it and still be a seedless grape? So I looked it up, I found out that see the scripts are crossbred but it's that that misconception that <clears throat> as far as i know there's no such thing as a gm grape i don't know of any grapes that have been genetically modified for any kind of benefit um i mean maybe longer shelf life but even that i don't think is is a a really common thing to do yeah, I don't think there's so. no grapes that are genetically modified on the market currently that's that's what i thought so it's just like, a variety that they're seedless right so it's kind of interesting that um because <clears throat> if there were a if there were if there were a genetically modified variant of grapes, my guess would be it would be the seedless ones, but they're not genetically modified at all. They're just crossbred, which we can get into whether or not crossbreeding is a form of GMO in another episode, which we, which we actually did. But um, that label was very misleading. So I was looking at it, I was like, non-GMO grapes. Are there even such a thing as GMO grapes? I was thinking about it, I looked it up, and there wasn't. And so it was, like, it was just kind of one of those things where it's just like, a lot of people will look at that label and they won't even think twice about it. They're like, all right, well, those are safer. I'm just going to buy those. But if you look at the price difference, they're significantly um, higher than the the grapes without that label on it. And that's another issue that I think is kind of um, not necessarily overlooked, but something that a lot of consumers don't think about in, in terms of what they're buying, like the the difference between the two and why the price is so much higher than, than where the other just for a one little label. Okay, then quick question. So you saw seedless grapes? Right. And then seedless non-GMO grapes. Right. And they both had a price difference. Both were seedless? They're both seedless. And one had the sticker and one didn't. Okay. The one okay. with the sticker is more expensive. Oh, makes sense, but should so, it make sense that way? So that's that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at though. And then the ones with seeds were the cheapest because nobody wants a grape with seeds in it. Yeah. So but that's kind of the point I was getting at. Like, there's there's a significant difference in price. And if you look at the grapes themselves, there's literally no physical difference. You can't see any difference. That's with every other label. Right. And that's, that's what I'm getting at, Not though. That's just produce, yeah. That's what I'm getting at, though. It, like, just, you know, that was just kind of my little, yeah. my little story of, of what of what happened. So I wanted you guys to kind of wow. go over the... 
well the issue there like why why is there such a big uh, price difference or why people pay pay that price difference if i may um in my research with this topic i came across um, an article written with a lot of statements from past secretary of agriculture tom vilsack mm. and basically what he was saying um and on our side as well with the labeling issue of leave it alone we don't need to keep over labeling these products he um loosely said i'll i don't know the exact quote but we're labeling what isn't in the product um versus what labeling started as labeling what is in the product right. so you know organ um hormone free antibiotic free gmo free you're telling the consumer what is in this product <laughs> but to what point do we actually tell the consumer what is in this product right. and so with that gmo free like you were saying on the um grapes we need to be educating our consumers so that they know what crops are and aren't GMO um, and so that we don't need to include this extra label on these products and get to the point where consumers don't need to, these extra labels telling them what isn't in the product so that they know that chicken isn't raised with hormones or else it won't be able to be sold or antibiotics as well and just getting to that point where we're educating consumers to eliminate the usage of these labels. Yeah. Well, Which, and it would be cheaper in the long run. I feel like for the well, for the manufacturers, and I think for the consumers as well, is that the more labels you put on, the more expensive the product is. And, I mean, you're right. I mean, people do choose having the non-GMO label, and they'll pay for it because that's what they believe. And like what Haley said, you need to educate them because there's no point in buying another product that looks exactly the same just because there's another label on it. But I was talking to a, an ag teacher when I wrote my speech a couple of years ago, and I told him, I was like, this is absolutely ridiculous that people can just slap labels on products and consumers don't think twice about it that they just think oh okay well if it's gmo free then cool put it in the basket but it's i i think that the product should just be as is put what's in the product allergy information nutritional facts and the name of the product and that's all you need well and with these labels too you're instituting um fear into consumers, leading to this fear-based marketing system. Consumers who don't have any agricultural knowledge, rushing into the grocery store, grabbing products, wanting to purchase what's safest for their family if they have um, maybe not such a strict budget in terms of groceries and their food products, um, they're going to want to purchase what seems the safest to them, and that's going to be the most expensive product. So they're willing to fork out those extra couple of dollars if it guarantees that their kids are not consuming pesticides and they're not <laughs> you know, going to get autism or something from these products because they're just not informed about it, and it's just instituting fear in consumers and it's really unfortunate that this is what it's gotten to and marketers have gotten really savvy in analyzing consumer trends and realizing what will sell and they're willing to fork out that extra cost on a label <laughs> because they know that in the short term at least they're going to make extra profit and extra revenue um, on these products. Well and speaking of that so that uh, reminded me of the Arla Food Monster commercial, and so it, this title of the news article says, Dairy Company has kids imagine food additives as monsters, then animates them. So they took a monster and said, this is what RBST is, and basically made it a, what Haley said, like a fear factor, that if you see this monster, which is now RBST, if that's in your milk, you're afraid to purchase that milk for your child to drink. And so when we watched that video, it was just like, this is so wrong, this isn't correct it all in any way and so after we talked after we watched the video we talked about it and said okay rbst is an, or at least bst is a naturally occurring horm hormone in the cow and rbst is just a man-made version of that they inject it and it's completely safe for human consumption i mean i could inject my arm with rbst nothing would happen to me and so just watching that video and having that kind of consumer mindset if somebody sees this and they're not educated about dairy products or even RBST then they watch that and say okay well now I have to look for this label every single time I go buy milk and so that adds time to shopping and that label is more expensive so I have a question because you know you two are both dairy freaks dairy princesses whatever you want to call yourselves anyway um the question I have is which this is a little bit not off topic but it kind of <clears> is <throat> Um, the label on milk that says that it doesn't have RBST in it, does the label say RBST free or does it say hormone free? RBST. RBST free. RBST free. Okay. I want to make sure because I was, I was going to say, because I, I thought it said hormone free, which I don't drink milk because I'm lactose intolerant. So I don't usually check for labels on milk. I usually check for on like produce and that kind of thing. But um, 
if I was, if it was hormone free, I was gonna say something along the lines of you know milk always has hormones in it, so wouldn't that be considered a, a lie by putting that label on it? But if it says RBST free, then never it's mind. Very specific. Right. So that that was another point I was gonna get into is how specific these labels have to get before people have to step in and say, hey, you know, you can't put that label on there because that's lying or that's not. Oh well, on the RBST free milk, which is on every milk now. I don't think I've ever seen milk that doesn't have that label. Mm -hmm. But underneath it, it says scientifically proven there's no difference between RBST free milk and regular milk. Really? Or at least <laughs> something along those lines. And so it says that right underneath it, but it's in way smaller print. So That's you have similar. RBST and then scientifically proven that there's no difference. It, it's just really, really tiny. And that's the exact same thing with um, chicken being sold as hormone free. But um, USDA does require poultry producers to place a disclaimer on poultry that says federal regulations prohibit the use of hormones on their products. But typically, the savvy marketer will shrink this label down and put it out of the sight of a consumer. And so that all that they see is the enlarged hormone-free label on the chicken. So when the consumer is looking and choosing between several brands that have no difference between them, they're going to go for the one with the flashy label. It, hmm. It's unfortunate, but it's what sells our products. Right, yeah, I think there's a lot of like, strategy that goes into all the colorful looking labels and all the marketing ideas and all that kind of stuff. So um, I guess kind of my next question for you guys, which this is um, starting to lead away from the issue of labeling itself, but more along the lines of how do we fix it, is it more important to educate the public about the falsehood of these labels, or is it more important to educate the farmers about why it's bad to put labels on their food in the first place? Like it's which, not the farmer that puts the label well, on the food. Well, my mistake, not the farmer, but the, the manufacturer, the one putting the label on the food. So is it more important to inform the the source of the label or the one that has to perceive the label? Which one would, would fix the problem faster? Or can the problem be fixed at all? Um, well, you can't really educate the manufacturer because what they are putting on the label is actually considered true, but yeah. they they won't take it off because that's what sells their product. And if you try to educate the consumer, I mean, you can't reach every consumer, but even if you try to teach them, it I don't know how big of a difference that would make because it's like I've been buying the same food. I might as well just keep buying it. I don't really care what labels on the product because I know that this one that says hormone free is safe and I eat it and so I don't think I don't know if that would really make a difference um unfortunately in my opinion I know that it, it um going towards both both excuse me both <laughs> sources um may ultimately have the best effect if we're trying to divide and conquer and, and just educate as many people as possible um it doesn't end with the farmer but it may start with the farmer maybe farmers becoming more aware of what's happening with their products once they leave their farm and um, them maybe reaching out to their marketers and expressing the interest in not uh, leading to this fear-based marketing um, and from there marketers will do what they want to do from that and if there's enough interest maybe expressed from their constituents then change may happen um, on the other hand farmers and advocacy groups can work to trying to educate consumers um, really working to reach as many people as possible. It's definitely not something that's going to be accomplished overnight, but um, it, targeting as many audiences as possible is definitely going to help the situation as best as possible. So I think uh, both of them hit um, pr hit pretty hard on the head, that, saying that we need to educate just the general public in, in, in just an overall sense. It doesn't really matter um, if they're the ones putting the labels on or if they're the ones buying the food with the label. It's important that everyone understands the repercussions that this, that this whole labeling deal has. Um, so kind of leading into another question I had for you guys, um, and you guys or the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, the organic label is the only label that is required by law to be on food products. Every other label on there is completely voluntary. So the um, hormone-free, antibiotic-free, pesticide-free, uh, non-GMO, all those labels are entirely voluntary. So I kind of just wanted to see what you guys thought about that in terms of like, I don't know how exactly to phrase it, but um, just along the lines of like, why... If they're voluntary, then then what can we really do about them? Because there's no law saying you have to put that label on there. So, um, you know, is is it? I mean, obviously it's an issue, but is it an issue that we can really fix? So yeah, at this point, most of these labels are voluntary, 
and it kind of resembles a rat race to see what company can add the most labels to their product at this point and start coming up with the newest um, and most trendiest labels that will really get most consumers. I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's really <laughs> it's kind of a trend yeah. Yeah. about it, just these different trends coming up that really catch consumers' eyes and lead them to purchasing these products. It feels like every year we have a different um, label. You know, you have like sustainable coming in and you have like locally sourced, all these different yeah. ones that aren't really exactly being followed um, closely by like a government regulation saying this is the guidelines for this label besides the organic label, which is strictly monitored. And so that kind of draws the question of should the government be more involved in labeling these products with like the FDA, the USDA taking over power of labeling these products um, reaching so far as into um, the dairy industry with fake milk. Should they be called milk, like an almond milk or a soy milk, or should it be called a beverage, for instance? And so this kind of segues into so many different ways of that. Um, but one more, <laughs> one little story I wanted to add into there was um, I actually had the opportunity to um, have a phone call with a labeling lawyer based out of Southern California. And in my discussion with him, one thing that really stuck out was... Um, my asking him um, how easy it really was for people to put labels onto products and he told me about um, a company that had come to him and asked him about um, how practical it would be to put the label baby approved on their products and while this maybe may not be exactly directly involved um, correlated with agriculture it could go so far as baby approved baby food and so um, the lawyer actually kind of recommended against this product as it could lead to more legal trouble um, with people maybe trying to um, question how it could actually be proved to be baby approved. But that just goes so far as to say people are always coming, trying to come up with the most trendiest, newest, um, flashiest labels that really will catch consumers' interest because after a while, people have seen a label so much that they're just thinking, what, what, else, what else can come up and can really teach me more about my food as they think? <laughs> right. So um, you kind of hit on a little bit of a topic that I wanted to start segueing into here. Um, and that was the, the fake milk, um, I wouldn't call it an epidemic, but the issue of, of the fake milk and, and, that, and that sort of thing with the whole government um, having more of a role in the labeling uh, aspect of marketing. And so this kind of brings up a more current issue, one that was brought to my attention through a podcast called Beltway Beef, um, where they discuss, which I actually show you to this podcast not too long ago, um, where they discuss this new fake meat that is being produced by uh, the FDA. So the FDA is, is actually trying to, um, which is this fake meat is supposed to come into the markets in a couple of years. There, um, I haven't, I haven't done a ton of research on this thing yet because we're gonna do a whole separate episode on the fake meat itself, and I'll have more more information ready for that. But there's this big controversial debate going on right now. Uh, between the USDA and the FDA about who has the jurisdiction to label this thing. So they're wanting to label it. That's that's already been established. It's not really an argument of uh, should it be labeled or not because at this point they're trying to get it legally uh, required to label this thing. It's already going to be labeled. But the USDA wants to label it with a, with a uh, label that says it was grown in a lab. It's lab grown or it's lab produced or whatever their phraseology may be. It's It's basically just says that it's not real meat that's synthetic or that it's it's got a bunch of different names i mean it's, it's cultured beef or it wasn't beef just or, grown out in a field or right, on a ranch right so they want a sticker saying that it's not real beef the fda says no let's just market it like it's real beef with everything else and that's not to say that um it's trying to necessarily lie but in a sense it's being misleading so well, i'm trying to compete it is. So I'm trying to, I wanted to get your guys' opinions on what impact this has because we're sitting here saying this whole time that we don't need all these unnecessary labels, but this seems to be one that we could all agree that we kind of do need a label on of some sort. Or that, well, it's going to have a label. So what label should it have and why should, should it have that label? Well, I think, oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. So a lot of our ag products that we have out now, I think the labels are very misleading. I mean, they are true that like chicken is hormone and antibiotic free, but it is misleading consumers. But if you put a fake meat next to real beef, I mean, how does the consumer, how can you tell the difference? So I think that um, if it's not an agriculture product that's actually being grown by a farmer or a producer, that it's actually being grown in a lab, that consumers do need to be aware that it wasn't grown out in a field, it was actually grown in a lab. So there's one more thing before I before I get to you, Haley. There's one more thing I wanted to add to that before um, we go too much further, and that's that 
which I don't know if this is actually their motivation behind this, but I think that the reason that they're wanting to call this not necessarily real meat, but they want to classify it along with the real meats is because the way they actually produce this meat is by is called cellular agriculture, and I don't have all the specifics on how it actually works, but they take cells from actual animals, um, like from a, a steer or a cow or a bull or anything they're going to be producing a, a steak off of, for example, and they take these cells, and so they use these cells to produce this meat. So in a sense, it is meat. It is, but it's not what we consider real meat it's not actually taken from the cow it's grown in a lab and it's not real but in a sense it kind of is so it's like not to, not to justify what they're trying to do because i agree with abby here and in, in that um if it's not you know actually raised out on the farm that it should be marketed it should be marketed um as such but at the same time i understand that they're trying to market it as beef because in a sense it kind of came from an animal i guess you could say that are all fake meat products do you know are they all coming from the cellular um that beginning? is, is from, that... from what i understand that's the most common uh form of creating this new fake meat because they had all kinds of, of other methods of doing it that's where like the whole pink slime uh, thing came from a few years back which that's disgusting but um the the so this whole cellular agriculture thing is becoming a lot more common it's becoming like a new thing i guess so so they're trying to market it's them. trendy well, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the most trendiest thing out there right now so they're trying to well kind of classify them all together i guess i'm not super super familiar with the process of creating fake meat i don't really plan on becoming an expert <laughs> in that area but this really is kind of uncharted territory for agriculture never have we really had a product um that's totally really synthetic synthetically made i mean i'm going back to the the um fake milk so those are a little bit more synthetically made but they're not made in a lab exactly they are still coming from right. an agricultural product and so in that sense labeling this product as lab grown is still beneficial to the consumer because otherwise they may not have any other idea um, i have no idea if it tastes any different than regular meat so if the taste um, kind of gives it away that may be a way for consumers to know but we're le kind of leaving consumers in the dark if we don't label this as lab grown because it's so different like abby said than just traditional um meat raised on farms um and so i do see however on their side one potential reason why they may not want to label it is because it gives it an advantage um if they're able to um label it as just regular meat they may be <clears throat> either able to sell it for a higher premium consumers may not want to purchase it if it's lab grown for those mm -hmm. consumers who maybe are a little bit more aware may not want to purchase this because they <laughs> want their actual natural um beef or their naturally occurring naturally grown um animal product i have no idea um how the pricing would range maybe for the savvier shopper if it has that <laughs> label on it and it's marked up 50 percent more they're probably going to want to purchase this product because it's the trendiest thing on the market right, for them right. so i mean it's kind of it can go both ways but i'm gonna have to agree that we definitely need to label this because it's something so different and not labeling it almost seems like we're lying to consumers about the a huge part of where this product originates from right and i agree completely and i think there's something that's kind of significant about this specific instance like Haley said it's something that um, agriculture really hasn't faced before and that's what really throws a, a wrench in everybody's gears here is that most farmers are opposed to labeling in the general sense they think that it's harmful to the industry that um, it's it just causes this it, even more of an of an educational disconnect to the public that we've talked about a million times before I mean we have all these people that don't know where their food comes from now they don't know what their foods made of like it's, it's really hard to make a case for this because it's such a new territory for us to cross into but that on that same hand how can we how do i want to word that how do i want to word this basically what i'm trying to say is like it's it's difficult for us to say that we don't need labels at all and then also say that we want this new fake meat to be labeled because it kind of makes us sound hypocritical in a sense i mean not that we're trying to contradict ourselves but we mm. kind of have to no there is definitely a fine line drawn in the sand well before i get into that there was um an article that i was reading because with the podcast that brendan was talking about with the fake meat is that usda and fda are definitely fighting over this about what the label should be but through this article it says the fda is responsible for regulating and slapping a nutrition's facts label on all processed foods created and sold in the u.s so yes they will be putting a label on there but if it's created in a lab and not 
like it's created in another place that no other ag product is being created i think that definitely needs to be defined mm-hmm. um in regards to the to the labels i don't think that this is a gray area um with hormone free and antibiotic free and gmo and organic i mean well gmo and organic those are definitely something different those need to be labeled and separated but everything else is kind of just an extra label just to throw in like oh this is this really is hormone free which it's misleading consumers however with organic and the conventional i think that definitely needs to be labeled i mean that's Mm -hmm. two different um ways of growing the product right but with this fake meat that's just another way of obviously just growing a product i guess and so that definitely needs to be it needs to be labeled yeah I, I, I can see that. The fluffy stuff needs to go. The stuff that actually matters, GMO, conventional, or, well, GMO, organic, and lab-created foods, ha- they should be labeled. Everything else needs to go. I agree. Which, um, I guess, like, because the, the, kind of the big argument right now, because nobody's really talking about whether or not it should be labeled, I think it's kind of uh, generally agreed that it needs to be labeled in some way. Um, I think it kind of comes down to which... Before I get into that, I think the kind of the big reason the FDA doesn't want to put the label on this is because they know people aren't going to want to buy a lab grown food. I mean, I probably wouldn't honestly, and I'm. It's just weird. I mean, I'm a big component, or I'm a big um, supporter of like genetic modification, that kind of thing, and so I'm not necessarily a skeptic in terms of what I eat. But I don't want to eat something that came out of a lab because I don't trust it. If I did the research and I found that lab grown meat had no nutritional, no taste, and no physical differences than regular meat, I might consider it. But it's just something, it's one of those things that, like, you know it's not natural, so it's hard to eat it with that mindset that it is regular meat. For sure. So it's just one of those things. It also is worth mentioning that um, there are very, very few genetically modified meats on the market. The only one, in fact, is a fish. Salmon. Yeah, there's there's no genetically modified beef on the market, so it's kind of hard to compare this to something else that's not natural in, in that sense. So, but all of that aside, we can talk about that in the actual episode itself where we discuss the fake meat. Um the big argument that's going on right now is not so much of what it should be labeled or or whether or not it should be labeled but who gets to label it does the usda or does the fda have jurisdiction in this territory and so there's this big uh hearing going on which i actually need to go listen to it so i can get the information um for the next episode not the next episode but the next episode we talk about this in um the the fda and the usda are just butting heads right now trying to figure out who gets to who gets to put the sticker on this thing because the fda says that they should do it for a variety of reasons most of which involve them being the ones that actually created the fake meat and they're the ones that know if it's safe or not and they're the ones that know all the stuff about it so they should be able to label it but the usda is the one that's in charge of labeling and they're the ones that is in charge of a lot of the labels that even come out today and so they should be the ones to label it and so it's like this just giant back and forth of you know i should be the one in charge or i should be the one in charge or so unfortunately the government can never make a decision together (laughs) this is what we've learned so who do you guys think should have jurisdiction over this issue i know this is kind of a tough question because you know this is a little bit out out there for what we usually cover but it's something that's becoming a lot more apparent is should the government well obviously the government's gonna have control over this part of it but which part of the government should have control over it do you have an idea? <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit out of my range. I definitely say, um, and I'm not really well educated on this topic, so I'm going to speak. No, yeah, but that's super. Yeah, right. I mean, surface level speaking, I would think that the FDA should have the jurisdiction to um, to label it as it is the Food and Drug Administration. Mm-hmm. USDA is a lot more general, um, to my understanding, mm-hmm. dealing with all aspects of agriculture. Um, I think that the Food and Drug Administration should be directly involved in labeling of products, approving what can and can't be labeled. Um, and so, in a nutshell, I think that that's kind of where it should go. But if the FDA is unwilling to do so, then I guess it probably should be passed on to an agency willing to do that, and that would probably be the USDA. Well, I think um, that they should both come up with a name for the label. Mm-hmm. And like the the guidelines that would go along with if you have a specific food that is created in a lab, that these are the guidelines that need to be followed for this label to actually be put on the product, and um, pretty much both of them come together, make a compromise if they can. If not, it gets put on a bill, and whichever one gets the most votes. Interesting. So, the way it goes. so 
We have three factions here. I'm actually for the USDA having jurisdiction in this area, which is kind of interesting because Haley over here is for the FDA, Abby's for both, and I'm for the USDA. So it's interesting to see how. No, I want the one that's better. I want the compromise. (laughs) (laughs) So I I believe the compromise could work, but the only issue I have with it is the USDA is responsible for grading the actual meat itself. The FDA is responsible for testing its safety, but also putting the label on it. So. I can understand Haley's statement in saying that the FDA should be responsible because they're more um, involved in the labeling aspect of it, and the USDA being the umbrella organization that it is, um, it wouldn't really take part in such a small task as labeling, but at the same time, the USDA has to determine if that fake meat is up to the same standards as regular meat, and if it's not, then it should have a say in whether or not it should be labeled the same as, as that meat, and so I think that there's a fair argument to be made in all three arguments that one should do it or the other should do it or both should do it but i think that if the usda is taking taking such an interest in something as important as this and that kind of shows that it's a little more than what we typically consider you know labeling it's it's a little it's not as as minuscule as labeling you know any other food products this is something entirely new so um that's just kind of my my stance and i think the usda just it, it should take a little bit more of a role than it has been um, just because of the, the sole factor that this is different than anything we've ever faced before, so we should bring in a little bit of the bigger guns than just the FDA. But, um, I don't know. I think that... <clears throat> you, you, Haley, did you have something you wanted to add? I, to just this? to, I mean, if, to tag to you, I want to just add more information, <laughs> I guess, about other um, ag-related products as well with the government labeling. I think that um, it could be beneficial at this point to kind of make the government a little bit more involved in the labeling of food products Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that hopefully they could help um, alleviate the misinformation being spread. Like Abby kind of said, in in simple terms, cut out the fluff and keep the ones that really are helping consumers, like organic, like GMO. Um, We may not really appreciate all the labels, (laughs) but if if that's what consumers want to see, we also have to realize that consumers are our market and we have to be selling to them as well. Right. So I think this kind of goes in with um, FDA recently made a statement that they would be kind of cracking down on the fake milks, um, the labeling of them as such. There was nothing actually like specifically laid into groundwork in that sense. Um, but we look at other countries, um, Europe has banned the, na- the the word milk being put on these fake milk products. Oh, wow. um, I know that. They have to be labeled um, differently. It's been that huh. for over a year now? Almost two Some years? Some time now. I, I it's don't been know a while. Spe- specifically a bill that would do the mm-hmm. same here in, in the United States and um, limit the word milk being used on non-milk products coming from a lactating animal. That would do so, but it doesn't really sound like it got much... Um, There's not much into it. Yeah, it didn't sound like it really it's went very, very far. Vague. But bills that are really, I think we really do need more bills that are going to be um, kind of cracking down on some of these labels, um, making sure that they can be proven. So a label's just sustainable. What differentiates as a product being sustainable and what isn't, or a product being locally sourced? There really isn't a set guideline for that. Mm-hmm. And so maybe more government regulation in terms of that, which, I mean, government reg- regulation is always two words everyone wants to hear. <laughs> but in this sense, if it can kind of help crack down and... Um, Help consumers. Yeah, help consumers and help farmers kind of in that middle ground where we have marketers almost kind of just this is where the, This is where the benefit lies. Mm-hmm. Government regulations always aren't the best thing, but in this situation, it is best for society as a whole. Right, yeah, yeah. I think that there's always very specific instances where we do need the government to come in and help out, but um, any time where the general public is going to be benefited the most, the most people, the most amount of people are going to be helped the most is, is generally a good thing, I, I, I believe. And this very easily could be one of those instances. So yeah, I think that that was um, a discussion to be had more in, in depth. And like I said, we're going to be having a future episode on the fake meat itself and the science behind it and um, whether or not it should come to the market or not. But um, for now, I think we'll kind of leave it there and We'll kind of jump into that later. Maybe we even have Haley back for that discussion. Um, we'll we'll see where that goes. I might try to get some, you know, I'm not sure who, but I'll try to get someone that maybe knows a little bit about the the fake meat science behind it and that kind of thing. But yeah, so I think that just about wraps up this discussion. I don't have any other uh, questions or comments or anything. Do you guys have anything else you want to say about labeling as a whole as an issue? Um, bottom yeah. line, um, yeah. I'll just say, yeah, I'll just say like, my, my closing statement, <laughs> bottom line, labels were started as something to help consumers and have just turned into a cycle of misleading consumers 
and we need to really step back and realize the damage being done and really work to kind of reverse some of these problems but also lay the groundwork for a more educated public in the future is my final stance on these yeah no I, um, abby you wanted to... yeah if you have any questions about labeling go find a farmer go find somebody <laughs> in the agriculture industry that could possibly know something about labels <laughs> and if they don't know too much i'm sure that they know somebody that can direct you to that and exactly. it doesn't hurt to ask a question. There's never a stupid question, even though sometimes there are. It, <laughs> it, there is an actual purpose to the question. Nothing is ever stupid to ask. Right. So it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Farmers would rather you ask them rather than ask Google right. the yeah. answers yeah. to your questions. Heck yeah. And Google you... is filled with a lot of biased sources. Right. can give you the, the facts. Exact, the facts, yeah. Exactly. And if you guys don't know any farmers, contact us we'll find you answers like we, we know plenty we, we of know farmers. a lot of people that can help you with any questions you have not even just about labeling just in general um any questions you have about agriculture because as we've mentioned you may have heard a time or two this podcast is dedicated to improving ag literacy to helping people understand more about the industry that feeds all of us so on that note i'd like to um thank miss fernandez for joining us today uh for having this you know in-depth discussion thanks for having me yeah our pleasure and then Abby, as usual, I'd like to thank you for coming in. You guys are so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's going to be it, guys. Thank you so, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I know this is a bit of a uh, longer episode than what we usually have, but that's all right. It's a good topic. Um, we're not going to split this one into two parts or anything, so that's not a big deal. But I think this is a topic that is pretty often looked over, but as it becomes more relevant in uh, our current legislature, is something that we need to kind of bring more attention to. And along those same lines, there's a lot of other topics that share the same... Uh, problem. So anyway, I'd like to thank all you guys so much for tuning in. Um, I believe that's it. We're going to be catch you guys next week, and hopefully we'll have an interview lined out. We'll, we'll see from there. But that's it for this episode, so don't forget, if you ate today, thank you, farmer.